Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to The Branch. We are glad you are with us, joining us live here or online. Um, As we get started, if you're so inclined and you're here and you have social media, feel free to go ahead and check in um, just as a way for other people to know that you're here and and to tell the word about what's going on here at The Branch. Um, We're grateful to have Drew and Paige here leading us in worship. So why don't you guys go ahead and stand with us. Let's see. Is that coming out? Can you hear that on the speaker? All right. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see y'all. Good morning. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. great how great this love oh it's moving on my mountains this perfect love is casting out my fear how great this love oh it well 
welcomes me like family and anywhere I go it meets me there that's it cause he is good and he is God what I earn it's not what I This is 
Father, there's so much that we can't know about you. There's so much that if you are the Lord of all creation, if you made us, there's things you even know about us <laughs> that we don't know about ourselves. And yet your word, your scripture tells us that you are love, that we can identify even ourselves through your love. And so, Lord, in the magnitude in the majesty of your love, in the goodness of your grace, may we find ourselves this morning firmly planted with roots that are pressing down into the soil of your goodness and your kindness towards us. Thank you for your mercy that even in the midst of areas where we feel shame, insecurity, oppression, darkness, that you are love and that you enter into those spaces. Lord, would you search us and know us this morning? Because God, there's nothing, there's no safer place than you identifying in us our areas of insecurity and doubt. We don't need to be afraid for, <laughs> for you to point those things out to us, for you to identify our sin and for you to say, I love you, you're my child. So Lord, we open ourselves up to you this morning, we pray that you would speak through John to us this morning. Give him strength, give him your courage to speak to us boldly this morning. And Lord, we rest our hearts and our lives in you, trusting that each step we take forward is a journey together in discovering the goodness of your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us and singing along. You can grab a seat. Well, if you're still in here and you're fifth grade or below, you can be dismissed to Branch Kids if you so be it. They're having so much fun in there. I know some of you are wanting to go back there yourselves, too. You're like, it's going to be more fun in there than it is in here, but I'll, I'll do my best. So, in, uh, in 1981, a man by the name of Joey Coyle, along with his friend Kenny Kozlowski, stumbled upon $1.2 million that had fallen out of the back of an armored car. And instead of turning the money in, Coyle decided that he was going to keep it. And when he kept it and tried to keep it a secret, his life began to crumble. And he was unemployed at the time, so the temptation to keep that money, I think, was even greater. And he eventually was caught uh, at JFK Airport as he was trying to escape the country and his life was plagued after that, and he died by his own hand in, in 1993. You know, when we do something wrong and we know that it's wrong, there's a tendency for us to be filled with fear and, and all kinds of emotions because it, it, it sort of eats at us. And for Joey Coyle, that's what happened, was it just the temptations were great, and he finally just succumbed to that. And when we feel that fear in us, we react in all kinds of different ways. And last week, we started this series as we're looking at what it means to not be afraid. And we started with being afraid. So it seems kind of an oxymoron in some ways to say, well, don't be afraid, but fear the Lord. Well, because as Proverbs says, fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if that's our starting point again, and we fear God knowing that the fear of the Lord is the thing that's going to keep us um, on the right track, on that path of righteousness. 
and can, that fear of what consequences might come uh, if we get caught can keep us on the, the right road in some ways. When we've done something wrong and we're overtaken by fear, there's, there's a simple response that can alleviate that fear in our own lives. And we'll look this morning at an account in, in Genesis um, chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can look at that. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is the account of Adam and Eve making that fateful decision um, that would impact all the rest of humanity um, until uh, Christ returns again. And until Christ came, actually, for the first time as well. So Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you'll die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. You know, God, God gives Adam and Eve some pretty clear instructions that they can eat anything else in the garden except the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, let's be honest. Like, if we've had kids, we've all been kids before, we know that one of the first ways to get us to touch something is to say, don't touch it, right? Like, forbidding us from doing something, for some of us, that's the biggest draw you can ever give to us, is to say, hey, you can have anything else, but don't touch that. Oh, really? Well, what's wrong with that? Oh, I want to go and touch that. And, and one of the first things that we see in this account in Genesis 3 is that Satan has this way of twisting things over and over for us to make it look that much more enticing, that much more tantalizing. You see what he says to Eve. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, it's almost a subtle little twist, but it's, it's a twist enough because God didn't say that. And yet, what does he say to Eve? Oh, well, maybe I can confuse her. And that's one of the first things we need to understand is that we have an enemy out there who loves to confuse us. He loves to throw curveballs at us to make us second-guess ourselves. Well, what was it that God really said? Well, did, did he say not to touch any tree? Or did he say just don't touch that tree? And all of a sudden, Eve's probably second-guessing herself if we remember last week what we had looked at, the instructions that God gives us on how to live. He, he calls us to walk in obedience. He calls us to love Him, to serve Him with all of our hearts and souls, and to observe His commands and decrees. We can easily think about how the enemy can distort all those things, much the way he did with Eve in the garden. You know, did God really say we need to obey him all the time, or do we just obey him on Sundays? Uh, do, do we um, really have to love God uh, all the time, and does loving God really mean that? Does it really mean that I, I love my neighbors as well? I can just serve him, like, on Sundays and the days that I'm free, right? Like, I don't have to serve him any other days. We have an enemy who loves to distort and confuse us. He loves to distort truth and make us think that what we heard wasn't really what was said. 
when Eve was talking to the serpent, notice what she says to him too, that God had told she and Adam not only to not eat, but to not touch it as well. And I think that's an important thing. How many times you found yourself struggling with temptation and you thought, oh, it's okay. I I can just have a little look or I can have a little taste or I can have a little touch and I'll be fine. In reality, we need to, the moment that we sense that, like that should instill in us some fear that we just turn and run. And you know, we live in a culture that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the last few years, um, primarily with men who, you know, who are trying to avoid tempting situations. And I've not been very appreciative about how the, the, the media has been very critical of the way that they've approached that. But like, if there's a way that you can avoid temptation by running the other way, there's no shame in that. Th- there's no shame at all. And it's not just men, it's all, all of us. Wh- when there's something that comes across our path and it's tempting for us, we shouldn't say, oh, well, maybe I can have a little touch or a taste or, or a look. Like run <laughs> far and fast the other way. The moment that it starts like building up in us. And Adam and Eve, they, they knew, Eve knew, don't, don't eat it, but don't even touch it. You know, go run the other way. Because God knew that just one touch wouldn't be enough. We can't just leave it there. You know, some of us might think like, oh, it's, I'm strong enough. I can do this. It's okay. But don't even risk it. You know, one of my favorite vi- Bible verses that's been a help to me for like 30 plus years since I was a teenager and I memorized it back then was 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And Paul writes this to the church there in Corinth. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And some translations say he provides a way of escape. And I I like that wording so much better (laughs) because sometimes we just need to escape. We need to run the other way. And when we find ourselves tempted in that way, to just know that, hey, first of all, I wasn't meant to face this alone. And that's what this verse says. God's always faithful. He's always going to provide a way out for us if we just open our eyes and look. And sometimes it's harder than other times. In verse 6 in Genesis 3, we see how God's instructions have been distorted. And Eve has three reasons why the fruit is acceptable. And I think the three reasons that, that Eve gives for why this sin is okay are probably three reasons and rationales that we hear today. You know, it's good for food. I mean, and just think about the rationale in that, right? God said you can eat from every tree in this garden except for this one. I would imagine that the Garden of Eden was overflowing with luscious organic fruit. <laughs> and God says, you can't eat from that one. And what does is, what is Eve says? Well, it's good for food. Well, so are the other like 50 million trees that are in the garden. A- and you're drawn to this one. It's funny because we can rationalize our wrongdoing. It's pleasing to the eye as well. (laughs) And I wonder how many times we've looked at something that was tempting and we said, how bad could it be if it looks that good? Right? Whatever it is. Like tempting things, they draw us because they're good looking. And I'm not just talking about like males and females here. I'm talking about anything that draws our attention. If that's our rationale to say, well, it's pleasing to the eye. And then finally, she says it's desirable for gaining wisdom. And she really plays off of what what the enemy said to her. That, well, God doesn't want you to get to the same level as him. And, of course, God wants us to be happy and wise, right? 
You know, while I'm in favor of seeing positive side of things and seeing the silver lining of things, I think when it comes to temptation, when it comes to sin, we need to be careful. And we need to not find all the right things with something. We need to see the wrong in it and run the other way. And as soon as Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree, their eyes are open, and what's the first thing that they start to do? They hide. They hide. They're like quickly sewing fig leaves together to say, okay, well, how can I cover myself up from, from this nakedness? It's interesting that the, the story that I started with about Joey Coyle was made into a movie, and the it's a dramatic depiction of, of what happened. And the first thing that he does when he finds that money and he decides that he's going to keep it is that he looks for a hiding place. You know, th- one of the first things that we do when we know we've done something wrong is we hide. We hide. We look over our shoulder to see, did anyone just see that? Is anyone looking? Like maybe we clear the history in our, our browsers Maybe we erase the texts on our phone or or the emails. Whatever it might be, we pull the curtains. We do whatever it takes to make sure that no one sees what we're up to. And why? Because we're fearful. There's a fear in us of being caught or of, of someone knowing what we did and then judging us because of what we've done. We can hide things from people close to us, or we can just say, you know what? I don't want anyone close enough to me to be able to see any of this stuff. So I'm going to keep everyone at at arm's length and say, hey, I I don't want you to see my stuff. I'm going to keep you from here. I think this speaks to the importance of accountability in our lives, to say, who is it that I'm connected to in a deeper way that can speak truth into my life, especially in these moments when they can tell I'm hiding. And I hope you've got someone in your life like that. They can sniff it out in a heartbeat. Like they know when you're hiding something. There are people in my life that like one look at me and they're like, what's wrong? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. I don't want to tell you. I don't want to talk to you about it. Sometimes we just don't want to be seen. We want to hide and it's not always the bad stuff. Sometimes it's the uncomfortable stuff, the stuff that maybe we're, we, we might feel shame for, you know, depression and other things in our life that have become such stigma in our culture and our society. But are we letting ourselves be seen by other people? Or are we hiding and distancing ourselves from people? Adam and Eve, they tried to cover up that nakedness with, with the fig leaves. And then what, what's the second thing that they did? First they hid, and then they blamed. When we're caught in our sin, we hide and we blame. We hide and we blame. We might not do it always in that order, but I guarantee you that when we find ourselves in that place, when that fear starts welling up within us, we're going we're gonna to hide, and then if we ever get caught, we're going to blame everybody else. And it's amazing to me, in a split second, how quickly Adam throws everybody under the bus, right? I mean, in one fell swoop, Adam, like, throws Eve and God under the bus. You, you notice what he says here? He says, the woman you put here with me. I mean, I'm like, really? It it says that while she was eating the fruit, he was standing right there. Like, he didn't say, hey, don't touch that. He just watched, and then he took a bite, and then he blamed God and Eve for what he did. Well, it's your fault. It's funny, every time that we get into that place and we get caught, one of the first things we do is blame. Any of us who have been parents can attest to what we've seen with our kids. How often, the moment that they're caught, they say, well, she made me do it. Well, she, put, she hit me first. He, he took my toy. Whatever it is, it starts then. And for some of us, it doesn't end. We keep blaming and blaming. 
And funny thing is, too, we take a step back from this story at what Adam and Eve do, and it, it's, it's almost comical what they do because they start hiding. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I, I'm in the garden. I've just broken the one rule that God gave me, and then all of a sudden I'm trying to cover up, and I hide behind like a tree. Like, where were they hiding from God? And yet still, even in the midst of where we are, some of us try to do the very same thing. Like, it's laughable when we look at Adam and Eve and we're like, dummies, what were they thinking? And yet all of us have done that before in our lives. The moment that we've done the thing that we know we shouldn't do, we start hiding and we say, I'm going to hide from God. And we can't. In verse 9, God says, where are you? Which I think is kind of funny too. Because I don't think he said it because he didn't know. I mean, he's God, right? Like God's there going, hmm, I wonder where, like playing hide and seek with God, right? It's what Adam and Eve are doing here. And, And all the while, God has seen them through every single step. And yet, they think that they can hide. I don't think God asked that question because he didn't know where they were. I think God asked that question as an opportunity for them to do the very thing that they needed to just get rid of the fear, get rid of all the things that were in them. They needed to just confess and repent at that moment. They need to just own up to it. I mean, again, if if any of us are parents or we've seen this happen before, we know that oftentimes, like, what's one of the first questions that we we ask our kids when they're caught red-handed? What are you doing? Well, we know what they're doing, but we're giving them an opportunity to confess. And I think that's what Adam and Eve were given by God here in this moment. We see in verse 12, though, that the moment we know what we've done, our first response is fear. And that's what Adam tells God. He said, I heard you when I was afraid. So at least he's confessed that much. At least he's told God that much, that it was my fear of you that made me hide. And can you think back to a time that you did something wrong and how, you were fr- how afraid you were about getting caught? And when finally you confessed, what did it feel like? You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to confess so that we can move on. We need to admit it and say, Hey, this is what I did. Moving away from our sin involves admitting that. You know, some of the things that, this is one of the things like in our country with some of the sins that have been committed, people can't get past the fact that like admission and confession are part of the process to bring healing. That we need to say, hey, I did this. Hey, I was part of this. Well, even if I was just complicit in this, if I can admit that and confess it, what happens then? We can move on to repentance and we, we turn back and turn away from our actions. You know, up until uh, Friday, I wasn't going to share this story. Um, but like crazy stuff happened on Friday night that that blew me away, and which I kind of took as a sign that I was supposed to tell this story. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I was, um, I was taking a class so that I could be a writing tutor, and the class met in the evening, and, and I did not realize until this one fateful evening that one of the classes I took during the day actually met in that class as well. And I had a test the next day in that other class, and as I walked into that class that one evening I looked on the ground and there was a paper I picked it up and what did I find but the test that I was supposed to take the next day well of course what did I do I looked around to see who was looking at me and then I quickly you know back then there were no phones because I guarantee you if I'd had a phone I'd be taking pictures I'd be like yep here I go 
So I looked at it, made sure nobody was looking, and I put it back down. Like, you know, when you do something wrong, you always want to make sure that, like, because you think everybody else saw it, so you put it right back exactly as you found it. Made sure no one was looking, and the rest of the night, man, I couldn't even focus during that class. I was so eaten up. I finally got home. My mom, she could read me like a book, and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, gosh. And I told her, and she's like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I think I'm going to talk to my teacher tomorrow. So I got in school really early, went to the English office and saw my teacher, and um, I just said to him, I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know, we've got this test. I was in a class last night. I saw the test, and I don't know what you want to do. And, like, he had this ghost face on him, and I was like, I have no idea what he's thinking. And the first words out of his mouth were, why are you telling me this? And I just explained. I said, you know what? I said, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I, I, this, is, uh, this is confession. Like, I, when I do something wrong, I'm supposed to confess that and tell. And he said, you know, he thought, and he said, you know, just go ahead and take the test. Don't worry about it. I didn't ace the test, which you would have thought that I would, but I didn't. But on the back of that test, he wrote me a little note. And then later on that year, he wrote um, in my notebook, and I don't think anyone can decipher. I had to work really hard to decipher what he said in the yearbook. Put that picture up, Dill. He said this, he said, not many students asked me to sign their yearbooks. I can't imagine why, but I'm very pleased and in a way honored that you asked me. I always remember that little almost insignificant action of yours because in the final analysis, it's not insignificant. It in part defines you. I wish you continued success in being the person you already are. Well, I, I'm a sucker for nostalgia, and on Friday, 30-plus years after this incident, I just started getting nostalgic and looking through my yearbook, which made me scan this thing, and I went to Google, and I started searching. Now, I, I'm old enough that most of my high school teachers are dead, okay? So, um, so I was searching in the obituaries, like, thinking, like, okay, I'm going to find my teacher, like, because I was curious what happened to him. Well, it brought, I mean, it brought me right to like an address with an email and everything. So I'm like, All right, I, you know, I'm bold. I'm not afraid to be wrong. So I just sent an email. I'm like, hey, do you happen to be the same, you know, Mr. Matthews who taught at Darien High School, you know? And he said, yes. And if you, you're this, you have a dad who is a pastor. And if I remember, there was a significant event that happened between us. And I was like, what just happened here? He went on to write, he said, I remember it quite well because the incident revealed a most admirable aspect of your character. And I thought then that you would turn out all right. That you would live a successful life, not necessarily in financial terms, though maybe so, but in more important ways. I've been, I'm, there's like 18 or 20 emails between the two of us since Friday. And, uh, I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen. But it was a huge reminder to me of two things. First of all, we never know what God is doing underneath the surface. Like, that happened 30 years ago. And I'm not into telling stories that happened, like, 30 years ago if there wasn't an epilogue that happened, like, two days ago, okay? <laughs> the, the other thing is this, like... <laughs> We never know what God can use, how God can use our confession either. You know, when we're in the midst of that place where we're uncomfortable, where we don't want, like we're naked, we're frantically trying to sew fig leaves together to keep other people from seeing it. I'm not seeing like shine it for the world to see, but confession is incredibly freeing. And we never know what God is doing when we do that. When we find ourselves. If we don't embrace the fear and we turn away from that fear and say, hey, God, I'm just going to confess this to him, to somebody else. How can God use that? Don't forget what Paul said 
as he wrote to the church in Rome in Romans 2, 4. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not his anger. It's not his judgment. It's not his strong arm getting ready to pounce on us. It's his kindness. And so what do we do with all this? I think the first question we need to ask is, what, what is it that we need to avoid? Are there things in our lives that we need to turn and run from? That God's saying, don't look at it, don't touch it, don't taste it, don't give it an ounce or an inch, just go. The second question is a little bit more cutting. Who have we been blaming in our lives if we've been caught? Have we been looking around and saying, well, it's your fault, it's your fault. Like it was my spouse's fault, it was my kid's fault, it was my whoever's fault. Figure out who you've been blaming, confess that to them. And then stop. That's what repentance is. It's, it's turning, it's stopping that behavior, and it's going the other way. And that's the third one, is what do we need to confess? What is it? Again, I'm not saying go on social media, put this big thing out there, confess to everyone. But God, I don't think that's what God calls us to either. He wants us to confess to him, but there's something about confessing to somebody else. Find someone else. Confess. <laughs> It'll make you feel so much better, and you never know what God can use it for. Maybe it'll bring them to a place where they say, you know what, there's stuff in my life. I need to, I need to come clean on it. Maybe it's planting a seed, <laughs> a 30-year-old seed. We never know what God is doing beneath the surface. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you hear us, that you see us, that there's nowhere we can hide. It's uncomfortable. We're not always crazy about the fact that you see all that stuff in us. But we love you, we trust you, we thank you. And I pray, God, that you would just remind us over and over again that we're called to repentance we're called to confession. And that when we come before you, when we confess that, God, you're faithful, you're just, and you will forgive us. So, God, may we come as repentant sinners knowing that you're a God of grace who loves us. And through your kindness, you want us to come to repentance. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and join us to sing a closing song in worship together?
the things we feel strongly about here at the branch is that God gives us each gifts. Each of us are unique and um, he equips us with things to accomplish his work and his will. And they're not all within the four walls of the church. You know, part of who we are too here at the branch is that we seek to be the church as much outside the walls as we do inside the walls. So if you want more information about that and you want to say, hey, I don't know where to start, feel free to send us a message. And I'd love to sit down and say, hey, how can we find out um, how God has equipped you to be part of his kingdom work in this world? If you are joining us online or, or you want more information about some of the things um, that are happening uh, around, you can check out our Facebook page. Um, you can scan uh, and it'll take you there. We have a website as well. Try our best to keep it as up to date as possible. Um, you can check out information on there. There's a calendar of events on there that you can see. Um, if you're ever not here, which I know happens, especially as spring sports start to to uh, ramp up again. Um, we have a YouTube page where we're, we try to post our service in the afternoon on Sunday as well as uh, have a platform to be able to put our messages out on Monday morning. So if you're ever trying to catch up or if you ever want to uh, listen back on something that you think you heard or, or heard that you wanted to share, feel free uh, to go to, um, to our uh, podcast as well, which is on Apple and Spotify as well. We're always looking for people who will partner with us. People who will partner in prayer, people who will partner in ministry, people who will partner in service, people who will partner in giving. Uh, and so if you want more information about that, we would love uh, to give you more information. There's a way that you can uh, give online as well and would love that. Um, we are we could not do what we do here at the branch if it weren't for the people who say, hey, we want to partner with you in whatever way that is. And that all of those partnerships are important to us, whether it's giving, whether it's serving, whether it's praying, they're all significant. So if you're a partner with us already, thank you. Thank you for saying, hey, we want to be part of what God is doing and we're coming alongside you. If you, if you aren't there yet, then hey, continue to pray that God would show you. And if it's not the branch, that maybe there's another place that God wants you to partner with. But I believe firmly that each and every one of us who are called by God are called by God to join together with his people in his service in this world. And so as we go into this world, remembering not to fear, remembering that confession to him, confession to somebody else uh, can bring us a long way from that fear. Remember that God equips us to go out into this world. And so as we go, may we go with the authority of God the Father. May we go with the power of God the Holy Spirit. And may we go in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining us. And if you wouldn't mind.